The MiG-21, which was known to NATO by the codename Fishbed, is a supersonic interceptor fighter jet developed by Soviet Russia during the 1950s and 60s. Initially, due to the poor placement of the internal fuel tanks, the aircraft only had a flight time of about an hour. But with subsequent upgrades and improvements, it became one of the most mass-produced aircraft of its era, with many still being used in active service to the present day. Join me in this video as I build and review a 1969 vintage Frog 172nd scale plastic model kit of this long-lived interceptor. Hi, I'm Matt and you're watching Model Minutes. Before we start the video, a quick shout out to my patron. Following the recent launch of my Patreon page, at the time this video was made, I already had one person pledging their support. So a massive thank you to you. For more information on how you can help and what pledging gets you, please check out the links under this video. Also, this video was chosen by you, the community, with a large majority of you wanting to see this build. Thanks to everyone who voted. I couldn't find any safety warnings on the box, as this dates from before our more modern health and safety conscious society. So please remember that products like this will require adult supervision due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. The box features a well-drawn image of the MiG-21 taking off on a night sortie. The rear of the box features the painting and decal placement guide. And that's what it is, a guide, as it lacks a lot of information such as specific paint numbers and colours, leaving that down to the modeler's choice. The first thing I look at upon opening the box are the instructions. Unfortunately, this didn't come with any. So, following a search online, I was fortunate to discover that someone had scanned a copy and uploaded them. I printed them out, so I had a hard copy. For the age of the kit, I was expecting worse instructions, but they are reasonably clear with a fair number of stages depicting the build of the kit through exploded diagrams. Next, I take a look at the decals. As you can see, they have aged fairly badly. They are yellowed and look to be quite dry. I have my doubts as to whether I will be able to use these, but I guess I'll have to wait and see. A previous owner has removed a couple of the decals, but the majority seem to be present. The plastic parts are still sealed in their original plastic bag. They are moulded in smooth silver plastic, which appears to be somewhat harder than plastic used today. The details are reasonable, with mostly raised panel lines being present, but there are some recessed details too. The components are reasonably well formed, with some flash and moulding marks being present. The 37 components are held on four sprues, although some parts had fallen off, but fortunately were still present in the bag. Additionally, the cockpit canopy is moulded in clear plastic, with a representation of the canopy frames moulded on. Again, this part was loose in the bag, and no other clear parts were included. Before starting the construction, the plastic parts were given a wash in warm soapy water. This will help remove any dirt or oil left over from the moulding process and give a good clean surface for the paint and cement to stick to. I then left them to air dry. The fuselage halves were then cut from the sprues with a sharp knife. Any burrs, rough areas or unwanted plastic was then sanded off with a nail file. I tested the fit of the fuselage to see how well it would go together. The internal components, the parts for the cockpit and the joint for the elevators on the tail, were then added inside the fuselage halves. I'm using Tamiya Extra Thin Cement throughout this build due to its good flow and bonding properties, and the applicator brush in the lid allows for accurate placement of the cement. The fuselage halves were then cemented together. I then removed the nose of the aircraft from the sprue and cleaned it up. I was ready to add this to the model, but then I realised that I had forgotten to add weight inside the fuselage. As I intended to model the aircraft with the wheels down, a lack of weight in the nose would cause it to tip backwards and sit on its tail. I carefully opened the two halves of the fuselage up again and then glued some small coins as far forward of the main landing gear as I could. The fuselage was then cemented back together again and the nose added. 
the elevators were the next parts to be added to the model. Again removing them from their sprues, cleaning them up and cementing them in place. I believe that if you are careful, the elevators can be made to pivot in a realistic fashion, but I was not too bothered about this and just fixed them in place. The wings come in two parts which need cementing together. Some work was required in order to get them to fit snugly. When complete, each wing slots into the fuselage of the model, but again required some attention in order to get them to fit correctly. The underslung fuel tank comes in two halves and had to be cemented together. It is fairly easy and the fit is reasonable. The pylon which attaches it to the bottom of the fuselage is cemented into the groove in the top of the tank. The missiles are simply removed from their sprues, cleaned up and then cemented onto their respective hardpoint pylons as well. The probe, which projects from the nose of the aircraft, was then added to the model. This part fits into a pre-molded hole in the nose. The landing gear came next. This step is a little fiddly. First, a landing gear cover is cemented into position. I blindly followed the instructions for this part, and after completing the model, I realised they were actually drawn wrong. They are shown in the landing gear raised position, but with the landing gear down. They should in fact be in a more open position, folded down towards the ground. Mildly annoying, as I feel the instruction writers over at Frog should have got this right, but either way, it's something I can live with. The wheels are added to the landing gear legs by inserting the prong into the hole in the wheel. This is a little longer than it needs to be and has to be cut off. The leg is then finished off by cementing it into the hole in the bottom of the wing. You might have to hold this in place as it dries. The nose wheel is simple to install, inserting the wheel between the two prongs and then cementing in place. It can then be added to the correct hole in the nose. The air brake is then cemented into the fuselage. If you want to, you can position it open or closed. The nose bay doors were then added to the correct positions. This is a little difficult, so tweezers might be a useful tool here. This was then followed by the door parts, which attach to the landing gear legs. This is also a little fiddly. The missiles and fuel tank, which were previously assembled, can now be added to their relevant positions on the bottom side of the model. They locate into holes moulded into the plastic. They may need to be held in place to prevent them from drooping to one side. Next, the antenna, which fits just behind the cockpit, is added. Again, this cements into a pre-moulded hole. At this point, I'm now ready to start painting. I'm using Humbrol Metal Coat Polished Aluminium number 27032. I used this straight out of the pot, but you can thin it if you prefer. Thinning your paints will help prevent visible brush strokes, but this paint is quite thin already and has a long drying time. A few coats of this paint will be required in order to give a uniform overall finish. The cockpit canopy was also given a few coats of this paint, taking care to only apply it to the moulded framework. I did this carefully by hand using a fine paintbrush. Following this, when the previous layers had completely cured, I gave the entire model a coat of Humbrol 135 acrylic satin varnish. This was thinned with a little water to help minimise brush strokes. This satin varnish will become the base for the decals and will help prevent the silvering that can occur when applying decals onto more matte finishes. This was then left to dry before the application of the decals. Humbrol Matte Black Acrylic Number no. 33 was then used to paint the cockpit areas. The cockpit is very lacking in detail, and you might be able to notice that I've decided to not use the pilot figure. I thought he was quite crudely moulded, and it would detract from the overall appearance of the model. Painting this entire area black will help to hide the lack of details. Whilst I was using this paint, the wheels are also given a coat to depict the tyres. A few coats were needed, taking care to not get paint on any areas that were meant to stay silver. This step would have been easier if the landing gear was not already cemented in place, but I persevered and achieved reasonable results. 
The jet exhaust nozzle was given a coat of Humbrol 53 acrylic gunmetal grey, again taking care to only apply it where needed. A few coats of this paint were required. Next, it was time to apply the decals. As the decals had yellowed due to age, I had put them in a sealed clear plastic bag and left them in direct sunlight for a few days. This helped bleach out the yellow areas and return them to a more original looking condition. How long this will last for, I'm not sure, as I fully expect them to yellow again at some point. I then cut the decals for the Soviet Russia paint scheme, removing them from the rest of the sheet with a knife. I'll take my time with the application of these decals, as I have absolutely no idea how well they have aged. The entire sheet was then soaked in warm water and allowed to rest whilst the decals began to gently lift from the backing paper. The areas of the model that were to receive the decals were given a coat of Humbrol decal fix. This would help soften them into the surface of the model and appear painted on. I very carefully removed the decals one by one from the sheet and applied them to the model. They were a bit reluctant to come away from the paper and needed a little encouragement. Fortunately, I found that only one of the decals had cracked and I was able to apply both halves to the model and hide where it had torn. Whilst you watch me finish the application of the decals, I'll tell you a little more about the real MiG-21. Originally conceived in the 1950s as a development of the early MiG jet fighters, one of the first prototype versions made its debut to the Russian public in 1956. With a maximum speed of Mach 1.76 and a range of just over 900 miles, the MiG-21 could quickly climb to intercept enemy aircraft and use its variety of air-to-air -air missiles or internal 23mm autocannon to engage the target. The aircraft could also be outfitted with air-to-ground missiles or bombs depending on the needs of the mission. Although Western aircraft producers managed to manufacture superior quality aircraft with greater versatility, in the hands of an experienced pilot and using hit-and-run tactics, the MiG-21 could be a formidable adversary. As a result, it saw service with a vast number of nations, with over 11,000 being produced and some still being in service today. With the decals finally being in place, they were given a further coat of decal fix on top to help soften them further, then they were left to dry. A final coat of Humbrol Satin 135 acrylic was then painted on top of the decals to help seal them and blend them into the paint finish. I then mixed Humbrol 34 matte acrylic white with a little Tamiya thinner at about a ratio of two parts thinner to one part paint. This was brushed carefully onto the two missiles on the wings. Having done a little research, it seemed that the most appropriate paint scheme for the missiles was white with black noses. Unfortunately, no information was given on this in the instructions. A few coats were needed in order to give a good even finish. Citadel Non Oil Black Wash was then carefully added to the recessed details to help highlight them. These were the lines depicting the control surfaces. I was careful in the application of this wash so that I didn't have to remove any from the other areas. I've decided to leave this model in a pristine condition, as if the aircraft is reasonably new. Humbrol 33 Matte Black was then used to pick out the tips of the missiles as previously mentioned. The final step was to add the cockpit canopy. As is usual with my builds, I'm opting to use a general purpose glue which doesn't react with the plastic and fog it up which the poly cement can sometimes cause. This was carefully applied and gently pushed into place on the model. And here is my finished 1969 vintage Frog MiG-21 fish bed in 170 seconds scale. Now, if I compared it to modern kits, it would not do so well, particularly with the instructions being not exactly accurate, the paint scheme being vague, and the overall detail, fit and mould quality being a bit poor. But, seeing as this is a genuine older kit, I feel that compared with other models of the period, it would be a pretty good example and a joy to build. 
I've had my little issues with it, namely the decals being somewhat old and the instructions not being clear on how to attach the landing gear doors, but ultimately it's been a fun experience and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to build this little piece of modelling history. I bought this on eBay for £3 and I can say that it was well worth the money I paid for it. I am aware that kits like this, in this condition, sometimes go for extortionate amounts and are then left on a shelf or display, never to be built. I guess I was lucky with this one, because when I get my hands on a kit, I'm going to build it for you all to see. I know that this kit has been in production in different versions with various paint schemes over the history of its life, having changed between different model manufacturers and retailers over the years, most recently being included as part of the Academy range, but with some minor updates to the tooling. It took a couple of days to build, mostly due to the drying time of the paints, but realistically it doesn't take a great deal of skill or effort due to the low part count and relatively easy paint scheme. If this kind of aircraft is what you're into, I recommend you see if you can get one of these, or perhaps a later version to add to your collection. In conclusion, this is a cool bit of modelling history that I'm glad to have had the chance to build. It's not up to the standard of model kits today, but I'm really happy with how my MiG-21 fishbed from Frog turned out. As always, let me know what you think of my build, techniques and finished model in the comments below. I'm also keen to hear your suggestions as to other videos and models that you'd like to see me feature on my channel, so feel free to post that too. All that's left to say is thanks for watching this video and don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe and click that notification button in order to see more content and help support the channel and feel free to share this video with your family and friends. Also, please check out my Patreon page and consider pledging your support. From as little as $1 a month, you'll be able to get bonus content and other perks not available anywhere else on any of my social networking accounts. You'll also be helping to ensure that I can continue to create the content that you all love and enjoy. Don't forget that if you'd like to connect with me on social media, I'm on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. See you on the workbench again next time.